So welcome everyone to this coffee with the curator pre presentation. My name is Casey Ihorn. I'm the curator of collections and exhibitions here at Bergstrom Mahler Museum of Glass in Nina, Wisconsin. Uh, really, this is kind of a new foray for us. Um, in the past, we had offered several Coffee with the Curator programs uh, on site. And with the current uh, COVID pandemic, we decided to try to take this program uh, to the information superhighway, uh, to the web. And so this is the first opportunity for us to try this program through Zoom. Uh, really, the program was designed to allow uh, dialogue between guests and BMOG staff. Uh, so this is going to be kind of a, an interesting way of offering coffee with the curator. Um, may turn out to be more presentation style um, and less back and forth, um, but there will be opportunity for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. I anticipate we'll go about 30 minutes or so, so plan for about 30 minutes, um, give or take a few minutes on, on either end. Um, do feel free while we're chatting today, while I'm chatting, uh, to generate your questions and type them into the Q&A function of Zoom. Um, for most of you, that will either be at the very top or bottom of your screen if you're watching from a computer. Um, if you're watching on a phone, uh, sometimes that can be an actual pop-out menu. You'll have to touch your phone to be able to use that functionality. Uh, but just to let you know, you're, you're certainly welcome um, to use the Q&A. If you have a question that uh, you know, I can't answer via the Q&A function, I can also allow you to speak. And uh, you know, that certainly is a way for us to, uh, to have you ask your question today too. So do bear with us as this again is a, is a new way of running this program. And let's go ahead and get started. So I, I wanted to start this talk by just mentioning Queen Victoria. Um, Victoria gives her name to the Victorian period. She actually, uh, she was Queen of England from 1837 until her death in 1901. And of course, Victorian art is, you know, oftentimes characterized by wide use of color, uh, fanciful adornment, and you know, that is certainly the case with our Victorian art glass baskets in the collection here at the museum. Now the museum has uh, more than a hundred of these baskets uh, as a part of a new exhibition that's opened up in the Mabel McClanahan Memorial Study Gallery on the upper level of the museum. We are currently displaying a, a selection of these baskets, uh, 35 or so of the art glass baskets are on display in that particular gallery. And for those of you who, who maybe aren't familiar with that gallery per se, uh, previously we had an exhibit of Rick Ayotte's works on display in that gallery, many of which uh, were loaned to us by Gordon Park, who happens to be on this call today. Thank you, Gordon. And then most recently, we also had uh, an exhibition of Perthshire one-of-a-kind paperweights in the study gallery. And this is what the study gallery currently uh, looks like. Before I jump over, there's a, an image here uh, of Queen Victoria in wedding dress. And so here's an image of the study gallery as it currently looks with the Victorian art glass baskets on exhibit. And of course, Ricky Bernstein's uh, fabulous Betty piece they're just at the, uh, the end of the gallery. So before we kind of jump into this presentation, I want to let you know that for the most part today, what I'd like to do is not give you a whole overview of every single piece in the Victorian Art Glass collection. Rather, um, I'm hoping to kind of give you a, a cursory look at a few pieces that are either on exhibit as a part of this show or, or actually aren't on exhibit, but you know, this gives you an opportunity to see the pieces regardless. And most of the pieces on exhibit were given to us under Evangeline Bergstrom's initial bequest um, to the museum. 
So we do consider uh, these Victorian art glass baskets, many of the ones that you'll see today, as a part of the museum's founding collection. Even though we're, you know, probably most well known for our wonderful collection of paperweights, uh, both antique and contemporary, this is still an important part of our collection and one that we feel like um, we really need to be exhibiting and sharing with you. Um, I do want to mention, as, as we look through these pieces, you'll see that for the most part, we don't list artist attributions. Um, and primarily that has to do with the fact that uh, we just don't always know who the maker for a particular piece was. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit as to why that is. Uh, Victorian art glass was, you know, typically, at least in the United States and even somewhat in, in England, Victorian art glass was typically not marked, um, either with any sort of, you know, stamp uh, or, a, or a, an etched signature. Typically, this glass was, if it was marked at all, it was just affixed with a paper label uh, detailing the maker. Over the period of time that we've had these baskets, possibly even before we um, ever had the baskets, maybe even before Evangeline Bergstrom ever had the baskets, uh, the labels have been lost or removed. Um, you know, when you go and, and buy a gift for someone at the store, typically you don't leave the label or the price tag on the, on the piece. And so you'll find that for the most part, um, Unfortunately, we don't have the labels for these pieces either. And because of that, um, again, we don't always know the maker. Part of that reason is that even though we can attempt to identify pieces based on some of their you know, visual properties, uh, whether they use a particular style um, such as, uh, as spangling or spatter glass, or whether they uh, incorporate particular colors or color styles like amberina, um, it was possible that, you know, workmen would travel between various glass factories. And so just because a, a New England glass company, for example, made uh, a workman there made one particular piece doesn't mean that maybe he didn't move on to sandwich and make a piece there as well using the same techniques that he had used in um, New England. So I like to mention that just because when we go through some of these pieces, you'll, you will definitely see that um, most of them are listed as artists unknown. So this particular basket that I've, that I've got up for you right now uh, may have been made by um, Hobbs, Brockenier and Company Glassworks um, out of West Virginia. It features a three colored ribbon form with a spangling effect. And the spangling effect is really quite interesting to me. Um, this effect is actually achieved by rolling a hot gather of glass across a, an iron marver at the time, and it's covered, that, that marver is covered in flakes of mica or sheet silicate. And so when that glass is rolled across it, it picks up these little pieces of flakes of silicate and incorporates that into the, the ultimate blown design. So as with most of the Victorian glass baskets that we have in this collection, uh, the handle, oftentimes the feet where, where evident, um, and the ruffled rim may have been applied uh, hot after the basket form was blown. And there we are showing that, in fact, I, I don't have an att attribution on this. Uh, though we do again think that maybe it was a piece from the Hobbs uh, Brockenier and Company Glassworks in West Virginia. So terminology is kind of interesting here and uh, many of the terms that you see on on the slide now, art glass, glass art, uh, studio glass, are oftentimes used interchangeably, uh, albeit incorrectly. Uh, and so I do want to touch on that before we jump into some more of the baskets. Uh, typically, the Victorian glass baskets that we have in the collection uh, would be referred to as a category of glass known as, as art glass. Um, art glass was generally uh, production oriented. It wasn't necessarily uh, 
didn't necessarily mean that pieces were, were any more than one-offs, that they were duplicated using the same molds, but they could have been. Uh, but it was generally offered at an affordable uh, price for um, you know, a middle, middle income earning family. Um, when we think of glass art, glass art sometimes is used as a term that we use for you know, um, all sorts of art made from glass, whether it's a one-off piece or, or whether it's a, a production piece. And then, of course, this term, the term studio glass more refers to artists creating in smaller studios rather than in a factory setting um, as we think of uh, these Victorian art glass uh, baskets being made. Uh, predominantly, those baskets were made in large factory settings, such as Sandwich or, or New England Glass Company. So I like to just mention that before we continue on, just, just to give everybody an idea of these, these terms. So some of the, the big makers of Victorian art glass baskets um, were producing these pieces really at the height of their popularity, and that would have been between about 1875 and 1895, but predominantly during the 1880s. And so these are just a few of the companies that were making uh, Victorian art glass pieces. So we have Boston and Sandwich, um, Vasa Marina, both based in Sandwich, Massachusetts. Uh, we have Mount, glass, Mount Washington Glass Works uh, based in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, but we also have a couple companies that were based out of Sturbridge, England, or the area in and around uh, Sturbridge, England. Uh, predominantly industrial areas, so you'll, you'll find that many glass companies were in Massachusetts and South Boston, um, you know, Steuben in New York, uh, companies in Pennsylvania, and again, Sturbridge, England, uh, was a huge um, industrial area making these kind of pieces. Here's a, just a, an image of the sandwich glassworks in, in uh, Sandwich, Massachusetts. So I mentioned that this particular exhibition includes about 35 pieces of more than 100 that are in the collection. Most of the pieces that I'm going to show you are pieces that were um, bequeathed to us from Evangeline Bergstrom. And so this is another really fantastic piece that is on exhibition as a part of this current show. This particular piece is a cased piece that features white opaline glass and then a, a green uh, casing. It features a thorned looped reeded handle. Um, and you cannot see the loop here, but um, if you imagine that top part of the the piece, that is actually um, a loop that it, it creates almost like a ribbon um, effect. The flowers that you see on this piece, as well as the stem that you see running across, were applied to the piece hot. Um, while many of these pieces were blown freeform, many of them were also blown into molds. And this particular piece um, was a mold blown piece. Um, but those flowers were attached while the piece was still hot separately from the mold. Here's another wonderful example of uh, a piece. This one was actually given to the museum by Marjorie Siebold in memory of um, her late husband. And it features a multicolor spatter effect, um, quite colorful, uh, maybe not to everyone's taste today, but again, it kind of epitomizes the Victorian era in terms of color, uh, in terms of just you know, general, I hate to say gaudiness, but some people might think it's a little gaudy. Uh, this particular piece has a ribbed rim. Uh, we would even refer to that as almost an, umbilica an umbilicated ruffle above the spatter, uh, spattered glass bowl. And its handle is also reeded and thorned and created from color, colorless glass. If you look carefully, this particular piece also has a, uh, a rounded foot at its base. Now, many of these pieces were oftentimes referred to as bride's baskets. And it's not necessarily that the uh, bride at a wedding would use this to carry flowers. Uh, she certainly could have. 
but more that these were given as gifts to brides oftentimes um, on their wedding. And so that's oftentimes why you hear that term bride, bride's basket used as a part of these Victorian art glass baskets. And I do see a question here from Pat, and I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that right now. She asked, was the mold ruffled at the top or was the ruffling done later? So I, I believe the question that you're asking here, Pat, is with regards to the, the top ruffle of the basket. In many instances, the top rim of the basket was actually applied after the fact. Sometimes um, it would have been ruffled uh, while the basket was hot, it would have been, have been ruffled with a tool. Uh, it really just depends on the particular basket as to how it was done. I hope that answers, uh, I hope that answers your question. Here's another really quite interesting piece. This is a star-shaped overshot shaded amethyst uh, basket. The overshot term here refers to the fact that um, it was created by rolling a hot gather of glass over a uh, frit, over glass frit, tiny pieces of glass frit. Um, it was reheated and the particles of the frit were allowed to melt into the piece. And that's how you get this um, almost kind of a shaded effect below the ribbing, below the star-shaped ribbing on this piece. This is a very good example of a thorned and looped handle again applied after the piece had been blown. Uh, interestingly enough, the, uh, the overshot technique dates back as far as possibly a 16th century Venice. So many of the techniques that we see incorporated in some of these glass baskets um, are actually techniques that are, you know, at this point in time, several hundred years old. I thought that this was a pretty interesting slide and part of it has to do with uh, where I'm going with this conversation. Um, this was actually uh, something that we were allowed to use from a Compound Chem website um, for our presentation today. And it shows some of the various uh, elements that are used in coloring glass. And so if you, if you take a, a close look here, you can see uh, you know, gold is often used in, in red coloring. Um, again, uh, cadmium, for example, has been used in, in kind of a yellow amber color, cobalt for blue, manganese for, for purple, um, uranium for uh, yellow green. Really rather interesting what has been used to help color glass uh, over the ages. Now some of, these, uh, some of these various colors have gone in and out of vogue, but most of these uh, were at least at some point in time uh, incorporated into some of the Victorian glass baskets. Um, I see another, uh, oh, nope, not a question. Just wanted to make sure. I do like to make sure that I'm answering questions as we go through. Um, so I do have a question from Caroline. She asks, uh, did these baskets have any function beyond being wedding presents or were they display objects only? I think that's an excellent question. Uh, they were, of course, given as gifts, but they weren't, you know, it wasn't exclusive to that. I think for the most part, they were probably used as, you know, kind of a, a bric-a-brac scenario. Um, maybe gifts, maybe just something that you'd set off to the side um, in, a, in a cabinet of uh, curio cabinet, if you will. Uh, but typically, they didn't have a lot of function beyond, uh, beyond being uh, beautiful pieces of of glassware. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for that question, Caroline. So I do want to show you, I, I mentioned uranium here, and this is pretty, pretty interesting. And I know um, some of you are familiar with the fact that uranium has been used to color uh, glass over the ages. Uh, many of the pieces that we have in the Victorian art glass collection, uh, the Victorian baskets, incorporate uranium glass um, to get kind of a yellow, uh, yellow green uh, color. And so here's one example of those pieces. Uh, this piece is attributed to Thomas Webb and Sons. Um, and it is made, the basket form is made almost entirely 
of uranium glass. So you can see it in, in today's presentation, it probably looks more like a, almost like a milk, uh, milk glass. Uh, in fact, this particular piece is made, is colored with the uranium. Um, the handle you see is actually amber colored glass. And I wanna show you what happens when we put these baskets under an ultraviolet light. In this case, just a little black light flashlight that we have. I want to do that, but it's not letting me do it. Let's see what, what happens here. Ah, there we go. So because of the, uh, the stable uranium isotope that's inside of this uranium glass, these glass pieces actually fluoresce when they are placed underneath a black light. And so this particular piece, you can tell uh, it's the body of the piece, the bowl of the basket that's fluorescing. Uh, it looks as if some of the handle is fluorescing. That's just a reflection off of the, uh, off of the basket when we're taking this picture in the dark. Um, so you can see that this piece also has applied um, flowers and stems. Uh, what's interesting about the uranium pieces is that for the most part, you know, we're talking about a negligible amount of uranium in these pieces. We're not too concerned about, um, about exposure uh, to radiation from these pieces, but some of these pieces will actually make a Geiger counter uh, jump above what we consider to be background radiation. So some of these pieces actually contain as much as 20% uranium by weight. But typically speaking, uh, that number is actually closer to one or, or 2%. And I do see a question from uh, Julie. Julie asks if all of the baskets are made from soda lime or soft glass. And, and yes, Julie, that would be correct. Yes, thank you for that question. And I, I do have questions coming in from the chat as well as the Q&A. So if I miss something, again, Taylor's here to kind of bring that up to me. Um, in case in case there are things that I miss. I don't want to do that, but with me being the sole presenter, I just want to make sure I get to everyone. Here's another great example of a piece of uranium glass in the form of a Victorian basket. This particular piece, when it is under the effects of the fluorescent light, excuse me, the black light, the ultraviolet light, really pops. Um, in fact, you can almost see the, the stripes a little bit better when we're looking at it um, under that black light, under the black light. So uh, I do want to mention to you again that we do have, uh, we do have again, 35 baskets on exhibit as part of this um, exhibition in the study gallery. We are open our regular hours right now. So that's Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 4.30, and then Sunday, 1 to 4.30. And I mentioned that, um, you know, the study gallery is generally always open as a part of the museum's exhibits, and we'd love to have you come out and take a look at these baskets. Um, I, I realize that I've answered most of the questions as we've kind of gone along. Does anybody else have any questions that you'd like to ask? If you certainly do, I can, I can give you permission to talk. If you don't want to have to type out your, your, your question, please feel free to, uh, to ask away. We still have a few minutes of time. Yeah, and I agree. Uh, I agree, Pat. That's, uh, it is really neat to see these objects for us. What I'm actually looking at doing is putting a black light in one of the cases in the gallery and seeing how that looks. Um, so we don't have that yet. So a black light is available and can be, uh, can be checked out, generally speaking. With COVID, we're not really allowing for a lot of touching of, of things that we don't, that we're not, you know, that we're having to go back and sanitize and we don't want to spread any germs. So right now it's not out. So that's why I'm looking at um, the possibility of changing out one of those case lights to see if we can make it a black light so you can see it on exhibit because it is really, it's really pretty fantastic. And I will say, you know, it's not just the baskets that incorporated uranium glass. Now, because of the availability of uranium after the Cold War, uh, for the most part, it's not being used widely in glass creations anymore. Um, not like it was, especially during the Victorian period and then um, leading up until really the, the 1940s. 
Uh, many of you have heard the term Vaseline glass, which was coined during the 30s. And so we don't typically apply the term Vaseline glass to uh, these art glass baskets because the, the term was used later on, um, but it is the same effect. Um, we do have other pieces in the museum that fluoresce uh, similarly to the, the Victorian art glass baskets. And I, you know, I'm always happy to show you around and, and show you some of those pieces and, and use a black light to do that. So any, any other questions? Well, I very much appreciate you all taking the time out to come and uh, listen to this today. Again, this is a Coffee with the Curator program and it really is you know, designed to inspire some dialogue between folks. We're gonna, we're gonna run with this particular program. We do have another one scheduled for December. I believe it's scheduled for Monday, December 21st. Um, so just to let you know that that is happening and we will promote that um, as we have a little bit more information about that program. Um, but I do appreciate you all coming out today and, and listening in. Uh, please feel free to email us um, or, or message us your feedback on the program, um, anything that we can do to make this uh, more enjoyable for you. And otherwise, I very much appreciate you turning out today to, to watch, and I hope you have a, an enjoyable rest of your Tuesday. Thank you very much, everyone.